Time is 2.30. Let's begin here. <clears throat> so project number three is due Friday, March 6th. Are there any questions? Yes. So do you want to find the number of iterations um, with the GLM? Mm -hmm. Are you supposed to use the defaults for the epsilon and the trace? If you want to know th the number of iterations that were actually done, so you could use the uh, trace equal true, which would show you uh, essentially what the G is for every iteration. Uh, something I think I failed to mention in the last uh, class was that at the very bottom of the summary output, it says the number of, of iterations. It will actually be labeled something as um, like a number of fishing scoring iterations. Cause Essentially, for what we're doing, this thing called Fisher scoring is equivalent to iteratively reweighted least squares that I had mentioned before. Okay. So we don't have to um, have another code to find um, with the trace and the epsilon to find the number of iterations. You can just use the, the summary form. You could use summary, or you could use the trace. I'm hoping that you you look at the trace so that you just see that that kind of information is there and you can see what the what the G is at every step. Are there other questions? Okay, uh, so we left off uh, last time on page 128 of the notes. I'm going to finish up chapter 2 here. We got one more topic to discuss. And that is uh, logistic regression models actually fall, in, fall into a broader class or, or family of models. Um, and th this family is called generalized linear models. This family of models has three different components always to every single model. And that's what differentiates one kind of model in the family from another. And here are the three components. <coughs> Excuse me. There's the random component, which basically says, okay, what's the distribution of your response variable? That's it. So, you know, so far what we've been dealing with, Y is distributed Bernoulli. So it says, again, the, uh, what's, what's the distribution? Then the systematic component is just simply um, the linear combination of the X's with the betas. So, you know, for everything that we've done, it's just simply that linear predictor beta 0 plus beta 1 times x1 plus and keep on going. So that's easy. And then lastly, it's the link function. That's what we will uh, focus more on here today. And that says, okay, you have these two components of your model, the random component and this linear predictor, the systematic component. How are we going to join the two together? How are we going to link them? And simply what we do is we look at the expected value of your response and we set that equal to um, uh, um, some function of your systematic component. Or to put it another way, we take some kind of transformation of the expected value of y and set that equal to exactly your linear predictor, your systematic component. So, so far what we've been doing is We've been linking the expected value of y, which again is pi for us, it's the probability of success. We've been linking that to our systematic component by this logit link function. Or in other words, the log of the odds of a success. So for logistic regression, random component, y is Bernoulli. Systematic component, just that linear combination of the betas with the x's. And then lastly, the link component is the logit link function, the logit function. Okay, so, but you might be thinking, okay, well, maybe there's some other kind of way to link the expected value of y to this linear combination of the x's and betas. And in fact, there are. And we're going to look at two other ways to do it. Uh, they are not as popular as using the logit function, but they are used, especially one of them is used. Now, for generalized linear models, now you might be thinking, you know, when I have a model like this, you know, what's, what's really linear about it? You know, it looks like some nonlinear transformation of my, of my 
you know, the, the linear combination of the betas with the x's. Well, the actual part of the linear, of generalized linear models comes in, has to do with simp simply this systematic component. And that is that we have this linear combination of your betas with the x's. Now, for some of you who might take, I think it's step 974 here, our nonlinear regression model course, a nonlinear model corresponds to cases where now maybe, you know, how the betas appear in, um, in your model, maybe it's like x to the beta power, or x divided by beta, for example. Um, just something different from this simple linear combination of the x's and the betas. That's what a nonlinear model would be. We're talking about linear models, and they're generalized in the, in the aspect of, okay, Instead of, let's say, y having a normal distribution like what you saw in your very first set course, well, y could be Bernoulli. In fact, y could be other stuff, too. Okay. So what can we use as a link function with, the, um, um, with binary responses like what we have? I think it's good for us to, to look, take a closer look at this logit function. And... You know, we've already seen that, of course, you know, we can link the, the expected value of pi with this logit transformation. We can link that to the linear combination of betas with the x's. But you can also think of it from a different point of view. You can think of it in terms of the inverse link function. So now I only have pi here, and essentially the inverse link function is this e raised to some power divided by 1 plus e raised to some power. Again, that's the inverse link function. And remember, there had, this, had, this function has an interesting characteristic, and that is it always will produce a result that's between 0 and 1. That's why we use it with the probability of success. Now, something I haven't told you before is that uh, this, this transformation, this inverse link transformation here for this logistic regression model, it actually corresponds to the CDF of a logistic probability distribution. That's where the name logistic regression comes from. So again, this model uses the uh, uh, cumulative distribution function, or CDF, of a logistic probability distribution, essentially. Now, it uses it just simply for the mathematical transformation. I am not assuming anywhere that like my x's have a logistic, logistic distribution. I'm not assuming my y has a logistic distribution. It's only the mathematical expression where it comes from. is from the CDF of a logistic distribution. Now, let's review CDFs. I would imagine all of you have seen CDFs before. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if maybe a couple of you have not. So let's just talk about what a, what a logistic um, uh, CDF would be. So let's let x be a continuous random variable with some kind of probability densi density function f of x. So for example, f of x could be you know, the old normal distribution, 1 over square root of 2 pi sigma e raised to the negative x minus mu squared divided by 2 sigma squared power. Now, an observed value of my random variable x is denoted by a lowercase letter x. We want to do this very formally. Then the cumulative distribution function of x, which is typically denoted by a capital F of x, is simply the probability that my random variable is less than or equal to some quantity. That's it. Okay. Now, how do you find that? Well, let's say that my x is actually continuous between negative infinity and positive infinity. Then I could integrate from negative infinity to x of f of u du, where I just use u in there instead of x uh, for what I'm integrating over to avoid confusion with what I'm evaluating the integral at. So what does that basically mean? Well, let's say I have some probability distribution function that looks like, or some probability density function that looks like this. What the integral is essentially doing is finding some point x here, and it's integrating underneath the curve, meaning it's finding the area underneath the curve, corresponding to probability. 
Now, if x is a discrete random variable, you replace essentially the integral with a summation symbol. So now you're summing all your probabilities such that uh, you get up to uh, the value of x, you could say. Now, the reason why this is called a cumulative distribution function is essentially we are accumulating probabilities. And, and you know, especially in the discrete case, you see that because you're just simply adding one probability to another up to some point. So, <coughs> to give you an example, and I kind of have this down below here, let's say that capital F denotes the CDF from a normal distribution, standard normal distribution, that is. Then capital F evaluated at 1.96 means what's the probability that a standard normal random variable is less than or equal to 1.96? That probability is 0.975. Should look familiar. So even if you've never seen CDFs before or heard the term before, I should say, you have been using CDFs a lot in your past stack courses. So we've actually been using CDS a lot in our course too. For example, the p-norm function is what will give you then that corresponding probability from the CDF. p-binome does it for a, uh, a binomial distribution. p-chi-sq does it for a chi-square distribution, for example. Are there any questions about what a CDF is? Okay. Well, let's look cl more closely at the logistic probability distribution. As I said to you, the, the, where logistic regression gets its name from is actually because we use this CDF from a logistic distribution. So this is what a logistic probability density function looks like. Some of you have seen it, some of you have not. But that's what it looks like. Um, it's for a continuous variable x between negative infinity and positive infinity. Uh, has two parameters, mu and sigma. Mu can be between negative infinity and positive infinity, and sigma is greater than zero. Mu does happen to be the mean, but the variance is not sigma. Sigma is just a, a parameter in our model uh, that is closely related to the variance and standard deviation, but not exactly. So if I were to find then the CDF, I would never ask you to do this on, on the test, but if one were to do this, one would simply integrate from negative infinity up to x, do the integral, and this is what we get. So does that kind of look a little familiar? Yeah. So essentially all that logistic regression does, it replaces this x minus mu divided by sigma part there, it replaces it with our, our, our linear predictor. Now remember, a CDF accumulates probability. So that means a CDF, or f of x, has to always be between 0 and 1. That's why we use then the, CD, uh, the CDF from a logistic distribution for logistic regression. Because it guarantees that whatever probability, whatever we get, our probability is always going to be between 0 and 1. Here's what an actual plot of the logistic probability density function looks like on the left. On the right, that is the CDF. That CDF, again, should look familiar, because in fact, this was exactly the same CDF that was on page seven, I believe. Yes, on page seven of our notes earlier in this section. Exactly the same. But back then, I was drawing the uh, logistic regression model. So what this basically means is that you can find a beta, and, and this was a for a model that only had one explanatory variable, and all I did was I found a beta 0 and I found a beta 1 such that I could get mu equal negative 2 and sigma equal to 2. That's all. Now one thing that will be useful for us, and let me, let me turn off my spell check here. Hold on. One thing that will be a little bit useful for us, I thought I just turned it off. Let me try it again. Yeah, everything should be off, but it's still flagging stuff as misspellings. Well, 
one thing that will be useful for us is that this p logist function. Because before, when we were trying to find the, let's say, the estimated probability of success from a logistic regression model, you know, I would simply say, okay, let's do the xp function, you know, whatever beta hat zero is plus beta hat one is, and, and you essentially put it in that corresponding expression. Now all you would need to do is take, and I didn't write that out very well, let me rewrite it. It's kind of crossed between two different ways I was going to write it. So all you need to do is take your beta hat zero plus beta hat one times whatever your, your x, and like the distance of a place kick is, and put it right in there, and then you'll get then the corresponding probability. And you can set 0 and 1. Okay. Note that, you know, this, this logistic distribution, you know, the density function itself, you probably think, well, geez, that kind of looks like a normal distribution. And in fact, it is actually uh, very similar to a normal distribution. The difference between a logistic and a normal is simply that there is, uh, the logis logistic has what's called fatter tails to it, meaning that there's more probability on the extremes than there is with a normal distribution. Very similar to how a T distribution has more probability, uh, probabilities on its tails in comparison to a standard normal distribution. So, <clears throat> okay, let me find this again. Oh, where is it? So essentially our model, here's our model right there, there it is. Essentially our model is again using this mathematical transformation that we saw uh, for the CDF of a logistic distribution. Now, when we write the model so that we have the log of pi over 1 minus pi, then you can say we're using the inverse CDF. So what the link function is in a generalized linear model setting is simply the inverse CDF. Again, the link function is the inverse CDF. Okay. So that's for a logistic uh, regression model. Let's talk about two other generalized linear models that use different link functions than what we got from the logistic probability distribution. The first one uses the inverse CDF of a standard normal distribution. Of course, a CDF or a standard normal distribution is always going to give you a value between 0 and 1. So if you use the inverse of it as the link function, well, now you have an alternative to using the logit link. Whenever you use the inverse CDF of the standard normal distribution, uh, you are doing what's called probit regression. Probit essentially stands for probability unit. That's where the name comes from. Um, probit regression models uh, essentially came out before logistic regression models. But logistic regression models are now a lot more popular than probit regression models. I will describe why that is later on. Um, there is actually an interesting story about uh, probit regression models. I mentioned this on page 134. Uh, has anybody heard of the book, uh, The Lady Tasting Tea? Well, especially if you're a stat major, I recommend checking it out. It was written by a guy by the name of Salzberg in 2001. It's about the history of statistics, and every chapter has a story. And there's a chapter about Chester Bliss, who's the guy who came up with probit regression. Uh, the, the, actually, the really interesting part of it was, um, was this was in the 1930s, and uh, obviously that was during the Great Depression. He was having uh, problems finding jobs. And so he went and worked in the Soviet Union during the 1930s when he came up with some of this stuff. 
obviously there was some issues that were going on in the Soviet Union at that time. And so I highly recommend that book. That's chapter eight of the book, talks about the probit regression. So let's take a look at what our model looks like. So first of all, let's look with, work with the CDF of a standard normal. The typical notation that people use for the CDF of a standard normal is the capital phi symbol. So in other words, capital phi evaluated at 1.96 is equal to 0.975. It's just notation. You just might not have seen it before. And so what that says is that the area underneath the normal density curve is actually equal to 0.975 uh, to the left of 1.96. So our model then is pi is set equal to the CDF of a standard normal evaluated at this linear combination of the betas with the x's. You could equivalently write it as the inverse CDF of pi is equal to the linear predictor. And equivalently as well, this is what's generally done, is you write the left-hand side as probit of pi. Just like what we saw for logit of pi, now we have probit. I guess now also hopefully um, you see a little bit more why logit, uh, where the logit name came from. The simple, essentially we had already probit, and we saw the log odds transformation with logistic regression, so thus that's why logistic regression uses the logit transformation. Okay. So here's a question for you. You know, before with logistic regression, I wrote out actually log of pi over one minus pi on the left-hand side. Here I'm just leaving it simply as the inverse. CDF in, a, in this symbolic form. Um, why am I not writing out similar to what I did with logistic regression? I mean, is there a mathematical function that I could write out there? Excuse me? Isn't it pi uh, less than one times the logarithm of zero? Well, pi, pi is between zero and one, yes. Yeah. But, but why, why am I not, let's say, writing out, you know, maybe, uh, you know, again, I mean, what did we do before? We had low log of pi over 1 minus pi. You know, I haven't even written out what the actual inverse CDF of a standard normal is. I'm not for sure exactly what, what you're saying there. I'll, I'll just I'll give you the, the answer, and that is I can't write it out. For those of you, most of you, I think I think all of you actually have some kind of calculus background, and especially for the stat students. Have you actually ever done too many actual integrals with the normal distribution yourself? You know, and you know, especially for all of you in the set 882 class you have actually probably um, sh uh, integrated uh, the normal density over negative infinity to positive infinity to show that indeed it is equal to one. Okay. Well, suppose, uh, so now you need to integrate from negative infinity to x. It's a very diffi difficult interval, uh, integral. If you remember probably the proof um, in like a cell and burger, probably changed the polar coordinates and, and did the the integral that way to show that integrated to one, I believe. Okay, so you just can't write this out. You, there, you can't just write out a nice little expression there for this, unlike what, what we could do with um, logistic regression. So that's why we leave it in that format there. Okay, so that, that's one model that we're gonna look at. Another model is the inverse CDF of a gumball distribution, otherwise known as extreme value. How many of you have not heard of a gumball or extreme value distribution before? Okay. Now usually I was going to ask you, so how many of you have heard of it? And I know none will, okay. It was in Cell and Burger. Okay, good. Briefly, I think a homework problem. Okay, good. Good, good for Cassell and Burger. 
Um, uh, anyway, um, this, if we use the inverse CDF, this kind of a distribution, we end up with what's called a complementary log-log regression model. And so here's what the CDF is. I'm not going to ask you to prove it at all. But that's what it looks like. So again, the CDF is always between 0 and 1. That's why we use it. And what we're actually going to use is 1 minus the CDF. So if the CDF is between 0 and 1, what's the range for 1 minus the CDF? 0 and 1. Okay. So now we're going to set pi equal to 1 minus the CDF, essentially. Again, we're not making an assumption that anything has a Gumbel distribution, just like we didn't make an assumption that anything has a logistic distribution or a normal distribution. We're simply using the mathematical transformation itself because we know when we use that transformation, we're always between 0 and 1. And so this is what then the complementary log-log model looks like. And you can see a better, you get a better idea of where the name comes from by looking at now the inverse link function um, associated now with, with using this gumbel. And so now we have log, negative log of 1 minus pi is equal to our systematic component. So thus, the 1 minus pi there is kind of like a complement. So instead of the probability of success, you look at the probability of failure. And the log log there, so complementary log log. That's where the name comes from. Now you might be wondering, why do we use the complement here? Why don't we just use pi itself? The reason being is because um, uh, you, you get um, uh, something different than what we've seen before, where you know always with the logistic regression model, as x increases. I'm sorry, if, if beta 1 was positive, as x increases, the probability of success increases. Well, the same thing will happen here with, the same thing will happen with the complementary log log model. If instead we just had, let's say, pi here only, then for a positive beta 1, as x increases, pi goes down. And we don't typically want that. Well, you, you, you know, instead of, instead of working with 1 minus f, f of x, you just use f of x itself. So set pi equal to this part right here, and then you get... Is that if you want to increase the, increase the, the x? As x increases... Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming there's a, a minus before the log. Th there's, a, there's a minus? Sign. There are two logs. The second log becomes a minus. Yeah. Well, then you're no longer working with the CDF, and you might not necessarily be guaranteed to be between 0 and 1. Okay, so that's, that, that minus basically comes from here. Okay, so let's look at some comparisons between the models. In the end, uh, especially for logistic and probit models, they're just about the same. Complementary log log can be very similar, but in places it can be a little bit different. So what I did was, this is uh, corresponding to my program pipot.r. What I did was I decided to, for just one explanatory variable, graph the three models. And to make this a fair comparison between the, the models, I chose beta zeros and beta ones such that the mean of the uh, corresponding to the, the distribution itself that's used for the uh, transformation, uh, the mean was 2 and the variance was 3. So this is going to give me exactly the same, um, actually, no, I'm not, not no, never mind. So it will give me a mean of 2 and variance of 3. And so for the logistic regression, that's what's shown in red. The probit model is shown in blue. Take a look at how close they are. This will typically always happen. But you're going to see one additional benefit that logistic regression gives you, and that's why logistic regression is more, a lot more popular than probit regression. Notice that with both logistic and, and probit, the models are essentially symmetric about two. Why? 
Well, remember how the logistic distribution and also a normal distribution is symmetric about the mean. That's why. Notice that for if, as, as, you, as x is increasing and you get past, let's say, this point right here, as x is increasing, you notice how the blue line is a little bit below the red line there. Well, what that is showing you is exactly what I was telling you before about how the logistic has more probability underneath its tails. Now, this is just being represented in a CDF format instead of what you're all used to seeing is, you know, the nice little bell curve-ish look to it. Uh, and also, a similar thing happens then as X is decreasing once you get below that red line that I drew there, that the blue, the probit model, is higher than the logistic ascent, again, because of there's more area in the tails of the uh, logistic model. Okay. Now, take a look at the green now. That's the complementary log log. And I, I want I want I want I want to restate something because I don't think I said something very clear. So, if you notice right here, red is above the blue. And if we look up here, the blue is above the red. Okay. So having fatter tails or more probability underneath the tails is represented there, where it takes the red uh, line longer to get to one than the blue line does. Similar thing happens here. Notice the red is a little bit above the blue. And that's, again, because uh, the logistic has fatter tails. So if we were to represent that in, in the most common format, So that could be a logistic distribution. And then we get my blue pen out here. And this would be the normal distribution. Okay. Notice there are some points where the blue is higher than the red. Where, where the blue is higher than the red corresponds to this right here. Now for the complementary log log. Let me do some racing. The complementary log log is actually not symmetric at all. And it can have, you know, some lot different shapes than the other than the other two models. But again, depending uh, depending upon the situation, very often it's, it's quite similar. But we do see some differences here, and we see some differences here. So how do we estimate these models now? Now that we, let's say we have some data, how do we estimate them? Well, we just simply use maximum likelihood estimation again. If you remember the likelihood function that we've seen in the past, where before we would have pi was equal to e raised to the beta 0 plus beta 1 times x over 1 plus e raised to the beta 0 plus beta 1 times x. And so now you replace pi with what the, what the probate model gives you or the complementary log log get, model gives you. That's all. You still have to use numerical iterative methods to do the maximization. In terms of inference, no? again, since we're using maximum likelihood estimation, we use a wall, wall inference procedures, you use likelihood ratio test inference, inference procedures. Now, this is next, then, the reason why logistic regression models are so much more often used. And then it comes down to the odds ratios. Now, remember for a simple model such as this for a logistic regression model, we showed that the odds ratio is simply equal to E raised to the C times beta 1. The key element here is notice that X was not in this odds ratio. The odds ratio was not dependent upon X. Rather, it was only dependent upon the, how much you're increasing X. <coughs> for a probit model, the complementary log-log model, the same isn't true. The odds ratio is dependent upon the value of x. Very similar to what we saw when we had, let's say, an x squared in the model for logistic regression. The odds ratio here is dependent upon the level of x, not just c itself. And you can actually you know, prove it. So let's take a look at the probit model. 
So with the probit model, I could also find the odds of a success. So let's say I want to know the odds of success at a particular value of x. So I just write out the probability of success divided by the probability of a failure. Then I do the same thing for x plus c. Now, if you were to take the ratio of those two things, could you ever cancel out x? No. Remember when we took the ratio for the odds ratio with uh, logistic regression, we could cancel out x. Here you can't. That's the reason. You can do the same thing with the complementary log log model. I've even given that on the test before. I've given that on a test before, too. OK. So let's actually uh, apply these models to the placekeeping data set. So I'm going to estimate the logistic regression model just in the exact same way as I've done before. Uh, the key part here, notice the family here. Remember how I said that generalized linear models are a family of models where logistic regression is one family? Okay, that's where the name family comes from. Binomial for the response, or you can think of it as Bernoulli. And then notice the word link there. Ah, I'm using that logit function as my link function. Well, let's look at probit models. The only difference is now you say link equal probit. And now R knows that you want to do a probit regression model. So the output looks the same as in the past. Here's beta hat 0. Here's beta hat 1. Even though that we saw in that previous graph how logistic and probit models are very similar, you should not necessarily expect the betas to be similar because they both use different kinds of mathematical transformations. With a complementary log log model, now you say link equal C log log. And again, beta hat 0, beta hat 1. So here's our, here are the estimated models. Again, the beta hats are not similar, are not, not exactly the same. They are all saying that there's a negative relationship between distance and the probability of success. I would expect that. <coughs> with, with any, uh, if you were to fit all three models in, 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 in any, any time, as long as, let's say, you do have, let's say, a, a significant uh, corresponding variable. So what we could do is actually graph the models. So what I'm, or how about first of all, we find, let's say, the estimated probability of success at three different distances. So let's look at 20 yards, 35 yards, and 50 yards. So as I was kind of saying before, to find the probability of success, estimated probability of success with the logistic regression model, now I can just use the p-logis function. Here's my beta hat zero. Here's my beta hat 1. I have my vector of distances there. So at 35 yards, my estimated probability of success is 0.85. You're simply using that p-logist function. With the probit model, now, since I'm using the CDF of a standard normal, I use the p-norm function. Here's beta hat 0. There's beta hat 1. And we have those three distances. So at 35 yards, I have an pro estimated probability of success of 0.84. Before, with logistic, 0.856. Not much difference at all. In a practical sense, this wouldn't be meaningful at all to Mike Riley. And then lastly, with the complementary log-log model, estimated probability of success for a 30-yard place kick is 0.82. Again, from a practical standpoint, it's not much different from it's not really different from the others. So now let's actually uh, graph the models. And I'll let you take a look at my code on, on your own. It's essentially the same code that we've seen before. But now I'm looking at three different models instead of just one. This is what we get. So again, red is logistic, blue is probate, green is complementary log log. And you can see just how similar that logistic and probit models are. Complementary log log is a little bit different, but not until really you get to about 
oh, about 50 yards, do you see large differences there. And just from looking at the plot alone, you know, it, it's hard to justify, you know, <coughs> excuse me, uh, necessarily one of those models over the other. Others, you know, where you do see the differences because I have so little data out there. Now, there are tools that you can use to, numerical tools that you can use to judge between the two models. Uh, for example, some of you have heard of the AIC, Akeke's Information Criteria. You could actually uh, compute the AIC for all three models and use that to make a decision. Um, but even so, like in, you know, in this particular situation, I see the, you know, the models are very similar and I have a hard time uh, thinking that you know, even the probability of success should be that high for 66 yards. I would still probably take logistic regression because the model is easier to interpret. We'll talk about the AIC in Chapter 5. Now in my book, I used to have this in my notes, but I decided to take it out to save time. In my book, I actually show you uh, odds ratios calculations. And you'll see with the logistic regression model for like a 10 yard decrease in, um, in distance, you see, of course, the, the odds ratio remains constant for any 10 yard decrease. But the same isn't true for probit and complementary log log models. So please make sure you take a look at my book. And lastly, in this chapter, so we've only talked about changing the link function with generalized linear models. <coughs> One could also change the random component as well. Uh, for example, all of you have done work with generalized linear models before, you just maybe never have heard that term. So if I let y be distributed normal, I get the regular old normal linear regression model that you probably learned about in your very first stat class. So in that particular case, so again, y would be distributed normal, and the length function between the expected value of y and that linear predictor is simply what people call the identity function. It means just expected value of y is equal to the linear predictor. That's it. No transformation at all. In chapter four, we will work with another uh, generalized linear model. This one's going to be called a Poisson regression model because we're going to let y be distributed Poisson because we're going to be dealing with counts. And the link function that we're going to be working with is the log link function. And what that's going to do is allow us to make sure that our any estimated counts that we get will always be greater than zero. It wouldn't be good to have an estimated count less than zero. Negative 10 times I came to class on time. That doesn't make sense. Okay, so that concludes chapter two. Are there any questions? Yes? Kind of off topic, but it kind of talks about what you just said with the Poisson distribution. You have count data, but it's negative binomial. I was kind of looking around the GLM function. Obviously, you use the log link for Poisson, but I didn't see anything for um, negative binomial. Yeah, we will actually talk about negative binomial. I used to do it in chapter four. I think uh, now my book is chapter five. So we will either do chapter four or chapter five. I haven't decided when I will present it. Um, and there is actually a function called glm.nb okay. that does it. So for the GLM function, why do you still use them equals binomial? Well, um, The GLM function allows you to fit any kind of generalized linear model. Um, and to be honest, I've never done one with assuming Y is distributed normal. Uh, <laughs> because there's the LLM function that does that. Uh, but I would assume that you could. But like with the Poisson regression model, we'll say family equal um, uh, Poisson, and then the link equal log. So I mean, you'll, you'll, get, to see, you'll get to see that in chapter four. But, I mean, there's even other, other generalized linear models out there. Um, I mean, it's so much so that this, this uh, function, this GLM function itself is programmed so generally that you can make up your own generalized linear model. You know, maybe you say, let's let y be distributed gamma. 
Let's let y be distributed uh, double exponential. Let's let y be distributed something. Then decide whatever you want for a link function, and it will fit the model. Obviously, depending upon your data, the, the results might not necessarily be uh, useful, but you, you can come up with your own generalized linear model. Is there a question? Well, kind of going off that, if you look in the help for GLM and you look under family, it says Gaussian link equals identity. Okay. So. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you know, I guess I, you know, I just had never try, tried that because. It, it kind of didn't make sense. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Other questions? That's coming on the, uh, chapter three that I'm going to talk about in 10 seconds. Thank you for the lead. Um, if you want to know uh, a lot of the theory and stuff behind generalized linear models, take STET 971. Um, you do need to have a mathematical statistics background in order to do that class, but you'll, you'll talk about those models in, in, um, in a lot more detail. Okay, so chapter three. Let's talk about now a situation where you have um, what I prefer to call a multi-category response. So chapter one talked about we had a, a, a binary response and you know at first we just assume okay all the items in it in, uh, that we are sampling are homogeneous and we looked at estimated the probability of success. And then we said well maybe our items that we have in our sample actually come from two different groups but we're still looking at a binary response. We're interested in estimating the probability of success, one probability. Then in chapter two, we generalize that further. We say, well, how about I have as many groups as possible? And how do I incorporate that in there? I let pi essentially be a function of some explanatory variables. Okay, but we still had a binary response. We are still trying to estimate one probability of success. Now in chapter three, we're going to continue to generalize. We're going to say instead of just having a binary response, maybe I have a multi-category response. So instead of having two possible categories, maybe I have three, maybe I have four. Or how about in general, we just call it J categories. <coughs> so what we're going to basically be doing here is a similar to what we did in chapter one at first, where we looked at some of the basics of these kinds of settings. And then we're going to generalize to a setting where, let's say, the probability of being category uh, 5 is a function of some covariance. I'm um, no, sorry, function of some explanatory variables. So that's, that's where we're going. So we're kind of doing that same generalization process from chapters 1 and 2, now in one chapter for chapter 3 for a multi category response. Well, what are possible multi category responses? <coughs> well, my co author is from. He lives in Canada now, and uh, he lives in the Vancouver area. Uh, what university was that that he was in? Simon Fraser. Fraser University. Yeah, very good. Uh, he was actually my my advisor at Kansas State University, and then he decided to uh, move over to Simon Fraser. And um, so, because of that, he made me change in our book the the UK political party affiliation example that I had to a Canadian political party affiliation where we have multi-categories. There are five, I guess, main political parties in Canada, conservative, new Democrat, liberal, all those block Quebecians, and then uh, the Green Party. Um, so <coughs> you can imagine situations where maybe you want to estimate the probability of being in one of these political parties, maybe as a function of, co of call it covariates, we call them explanatory variables in this course. Um, there's many other settings though where you could have multi-category responses, uh, such as in drug discovery experiments. In those settings, what drug companies do is, uh, uh, you know, they're trying to develop, let's say, a new drug to cure a disease. And uh, at very early on, before there's any clinical trials, they try hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of chemical compounds all at once uh, and put it in kind of an experimental setting and they look to see what kind of response they get to some, something. And so in that setting, if you get a positive response like, oh, 
that's good. Maybe we want to consider this chemical compound further in development of a new drug. <coughs> in other settings, the response of one drug, uh, I'm sorry, of one chemical uh, might block seeing uh, a positive response from another chemical. And also, maybe a particular chemical compound is not a blocker, it's not positive, and essentially it's negative completely. So there are three categories there. Uh, cereal shelf placement in a grocery store. So, you know, whenever you walk into a grocery store, you go down uh, 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 the cereal aisle. There's usually one aisle in a grocery store dedicated to it. And you can see how the, um, uh, the certain kinds of cereals are arranged on certain shelves. So, for example, uh, you might expect, you know, maybe kids' cereals to be on shelf, the, the bottom shelf, or the next high shelf above that. Why? It's because little kids can pull those cereal boxes off the shelves and put them in mom and dad's cart. Rather than if it was way up top, the kid's never going to reach it. Uh, so we can maybe look at you know, particular characteristics of cereals to try to predict its shelf placement. Um, I had a student um, uh, a number of years ago, uh, when I was at Oklahoma State, um, uh, he was interested in uh, beef grade research where he wanted to come up with uh, particular models that would help, me, help him uh, predict, you know, should this be a prime cut of meat, should it be a choice cut of meat, and so on. Um, interestingly, he is now a professor here at UNL in the Biological Systems Department, Biological Systems Engineering. I think that's the correct name. And then lastly, uh, a, a multi-category response that all of you have seen before in, in like a survey. You know, where you're often given a choice, well, do you strongly dis disagree with the statement? Do you disagree? Do you are you neutral? Do you agree? Or do you strongly agree? Uh, five categories there. You might want to estimate the probability of landing in either or any of those categories. Um, these kinds of categorical responses are called Likert. Uh, well, it's measured on what's called a Likert scale. Now, notice that some of these responses are ordinal. So it's a multi-category response. A person fits in one and only cat uh, an item fits in one and only one category, but still the categories are ordinal in some nature. You might want to take that in, into account in, to your analysis. And we will show, I will show you how to do that. But in other cases, you don't necessarily have any kind of ordinal uh, setting there for the, um, uh, for the categories. And so how do you analyze that kind of a uh, setting? Well, we'll talk about it. Okay, but let's begin first of all with the multinomial probability distribution. This is the probability distribution, just like the binomial or the Bernoulli in chapter two, that is basically underlying everything here. So I want to take some time to make sure that all of you are, um, understand the, the multinomial uh, because I think it will uh, allow you to see why we're doing what we're doing at times. So let's let Y be our response again, but now it can have, uh, it has more than two possible categories for the response. So category one, two, three, on up to category J, just to be general. What we're going to be interested in is estimating the probability that Y is equal to little j, one of the, one of the particular categories, and that will be denoted by pi sub j. N is going to denote the number of trials. So just like what we had with a binomial setting, you know, we had N trials. Well, we're going to have N trials here as well. Where the number of items that fall into, let's say, category 1, category 2, all the way up to category capital J is going to be denoted by N sub little j. So N sub 2 would represent the number of items that fall into category 2 in your sample. Of course, if I were to sum up all these n's, I get just n itself. And that leads us to then the probability mass function uh, that we will be using for a, bi for a multinomial. And this is what we get. We get n factorial over the product of n sub j factorial times the product of pi sub j raised to the n sub j power. What you should do on your own is prove to yourself that if capital J was equal to 2, then indeed you do get the binomial distribution that we saw in chapter 1. 
not, not difficult. So this is my probability mass function, just like what we saw with the binomial for probability mass function, but now for capital J categories. So with uh, the binomial distribution, we had the D binome function in R to find probabilities. Now we have the D multinome function in R to do probabilities. If I wanted to simulate binomial observations in chapter one, I used the R binome. Now we have the R multinome. And we'll see how that, how that works shortly. Well, if you observe N trials, then what's the likelihood function? Well, with a binomial setting, it was just simply the binomial distribution itself. Well, the likelihood function here is simply the multinomial distribution itself. So it's exactly what was on page 3.2. And one could show, so using some math, that the maximum likelihood estimate for pi sub j, I'm going to call it pi hat sub j, is n sub j divided by n. Makes sense. Just simply the proportion of observation that fall into category j. Okay, so now I have some questions here for you. What would the probability mass function look like if there was only one trial? Let me actually see if I can do a split screen here. So the top, I'm going to have the, the original probability mass function. So all these questions are leading somewhere. Just have that in the back of your mind. So what would this probability distribution, probability mass function look like with only one trial? Let me erase, oops. So what would happen to this part right here? It'd just be one. Yeah, because we have one factorial over a bunch of zero factorials and one factorials. What's going to happen here? Suppose we observe, you know, if I only have one trial, that means I'm only going to observe one of the categories. So let's say I observe category two. What would be the likelihood function? What would it end up being? I think I heard someone say, just simply, pi two. There we go. That's it. So in a more general format, you can say it's the product of the pi's, where you know the sum of those n's happens to be equal to one. There's only, it's, it can only be in one category. So what would the, the likelihood function be if one trial was observed, then another trial was observed, and then another trial was observed, and so on? What else, what would we need to do with our previous likelihood function? So let's say we have m total one trial sets of observed in succession. So, you know, sometimes I might observe category one, sometimes I might observe category three, sometimes maybe category one again. So l l let's think about it in general. Oops. Everything's independent, so don't worry about that. I don't know why this isn't working well. Ah. How about we just do it the old fashioned way? Instead of right, I do this. Let's go right here. How about I say k equal 1 to capital M, because I'm, I'm going to observe M successive one trial sets. And now I need to add a subscript here to help me denote. this again. So it would be that. All I'm doing is taking the product of what I would have before. Now again, you know, we're going to have some stuff cancel out, or I shouldn't say, I, I don't know, I guess I don't like cancel out, but um, you know, some stuff falls out. Yeah, <laughs> it's the same thing. Um, Stuff is equal to one. I think that's the better way to put it. Okay, so the stuff in yellow is going to be equal to one, and then you're going to take a product of a whole bunch of pies. Okay. 
Um, oh, I should, actually I wrote this wrong here. That's going to lead into something next. So let's assume that we still have the same probabilities for each set of trials. Okay? So that would be my likelihood function. Now if I want to find maximum likelihood estimates, then I, you know, we've looked at mathematically essentially how you would do that. You could do that here. Okay. Now what would the likelihood function be if n trials were observed, then another n trials were observed independently of the previous set of trials, and so on. So there are m total sets. Now, since I had written it this way, there. Now there is no simplification. So you don't have stuff falling out anymore. And that's what you would have. Any questions so far? Because this is going to be essential for you to get these four questions, I believe, so that you know what the likelihood function is going to look like once we get into what's called multinomial regression. Okay. Now, consider the same scenario as in the last question, except now with the possibility that these probabilities essentially could change for each set of trials. And now there is the difference there. I put a subscript k on the pi. So now you can imagine, let's say, that each set of trials corresponds to a set of explanatory variables. And the pi's are a function of the explanatory variables. These explanatory variables then they have, are, are basically set equal to pi in terms of like a linear combination of the betas with the x's. And then you would want to maximize this likelihood function to come up with the MLEs for the betas. So, uh, not today, but um, maybe uh, definitely next week we will look at multinomial regression and multinomial regression is going to use that as your likelihood function. More on that when we get to it. Okay. Let me remove some of this out. There we go. So that takes us to now, I guess, essentially the top of page 3.4. Let's see what a multinomial simulated sample will look like. We did this back when we were working with the binomial. And again, I think this is just going to help you understand the multinomial better. And so let's consider a setting where we have one set of trials, where we have 1,000 uh, trials that are being done. And we have the probability being in category 1 of 0.25, all the way down to the probability being in category 5 equal to 0.1. Notice that if I were to sum up these probabilities, what would I get? 1. So you're in one and only one category, essentially. So to do this, then, I'm going to set a seed number so I can reproduce my results. And pi sub j is going to be a vector of all those probabilities we just saw. And I'm going to use the R multinome function to simulate the data. My number of trials is 1,000. That's what's uh, done by the size argument. The N argument is actually how many sets of trials do you have. I'm going to have one set here. Prob corresponds to the probabilities. So again, category 1 would correspond to the first probability. Category 2 would correspond to the second probability, and so on. All my results are going to go in an object called n sub j. So that if I type n sub j, there is my first set of multinomial observations, you could say. So 242 for category 1. And we can put this in a nice data frame with the corresponding maximum likelihood estimates as well. I take the n dot j divided by 1,000. Let's see what we get. So pi hat is 0 0.242 for the first category. Remember what we actually set pi uh, 1 to be? 0 
and you're, we're getting again what we would expect. You know, our proportions are close to what the actual parameters are. Well, let's say that there's actually five separate sets of 1,000 uh, trials. What would we get? Well, now we just change the n argument to 5. And, and what R gives us, instead of having, let's say, one column of data, now it gives us five columns of data, representing the five sets of 1,000 trials. You can again find the maximum likelihood estimates for each set of trials and you're getting what you would expect in terms of the pies. But of course, notice there is variability from one set to another because the errors are different samples. So that takes us to page 3.5 then. So in section 1.2 of the book, or of our notes, um, you know, we were looking at two by two contingency tables. We have two rows, two columns. Now we're going to extend this to i by j, and we're going to then uh, show how the multinomial distribution comes into play when we're talking about the counts in the table. So here's the setup. First of all, let's suppose that the counts in a i row j column table comes come about through one multinomial distribution. We're going to let x be the row variable. It has levels of 1 through capital I. Y is going to be the column variable. It has levels 1 through capital J. The joint probability of being in category I for x, category J for y, is going to be pi sub ij. These pi sub j's, pi sub ij's, uh, will, if you sum them all up, they are going to be equal to 1 because you are going to be in, let's say, one and only one cell of that table. We're going to let the cell count for row i, column j, be n sub i, j. This is a very common notation that people use. And, of course, these n's sum up to just n itself. So here's a set of contingency tables, and that summarizes what we just got done talking about. So the probability of being in row 1 in category 2 for the column is uh, pi sub 1, 2. The corresponding count is n sub 1, 2. And then you can even talk about maximum likelihood estimates as well. I am perhaps getting ahead of myself, but that's okay. Uh, pi hat sub ij is equal to n sub ij divided by n. But where do these maximum likelihood estimates come from? It comes from Basically, assuming that there is one overall multinomial distribution for the i times j cells of that contingency table. So before we, where we have n1, n2, all the way up to n sub capital J, now we're just going to re-index stuff. We're going to allow us to have a row index and a column index. So now we have n11 n12 all the way up to n sub uh, capital I capital J, all those counts correspond to one multinomial distribution. What would the likelihood function look like that would eventually allow you to come up with those maximum likelihood estimates? Well, this is our likelihood function. Exactly the same as what we began with at the beginning of this chapter, but now I have two subscripts instead of one. On, on, on everything. You can even talk about marginal distributions as well. So, you know, we've talked about marginal margins before of a contingency table. You know, here are, you know, like, for example, with the Larry Bird data, come on. With the Larry Bird data, we looked at, well, what's, what's the probability Larry Bird miss, or, um, makes the first free throw where you don't care about what happens on the second? And we say, well, that's like what's often referred to as a marginal probability. And my computer is acting up a little bit here. Well, that's odd. I'll have to do it the old-fashioned way and highlight it with my mouse. I don't think I've ever had that happen to me before. 
So those are marginal probabilities. You know, so pi sub 1 plus, what that denotes is the probability of being in category 1 for the rows, where you don't care about the columns at all. Uh, pi sub uh, capital I plus says, okay, probability you're in row capital I for X, where you don't care about Y at all. And all that represents then, for example, this pi 1 plus, it's just a sum of those probabilities. So that's why you see a little plus symbol there in that second subscript. So you're summing over the columns. You do a similar thing for the, for the columns as well. So here are some marginal counts there. Now notice that if I were to add these guys up or add these guys up, of course you get one. So in fact, on the margins, you have multinomial distributions themselves. So this is an I category multinomial. This corresponds to a J category multinomial where the corresponding, if you think of it in terms of random variables, are represented by the n's. Maximum likelihood estimates for, let's say, pi sub i plus is what you would expect. It's the sample proportion. Hopefully it's not too difficult. It's just uh, the, the idea of conceptualizing in terms of a multinomial distribution, which is going to be very helpful as we move along, and also, obviously, the notation, too. That can be uh, foreign if you've never seen something like this before. So let's look at how, then, I could simulate counts for a contingency table. So let's say that I have a 2 by 3 contingency table. And I want to have 1,000 observations in that contingency table. Six cells, 1,000 observations. Here are my actual cell probabilities. And so what I can do is just simply put all those cell probabilities, those pi's, into a vector. And then just to show you what it looks like in terms of a contingency table-like structure, I can use the array function as we've done before. So I say array, data, here's my um, uh, corresponding probabilities. It's going to be a 2 by 3 table. I use the list function to help me number the uh, rows and the columns. And here's my table. To actually simulate the data, I use the R multinomial again. One set of trials, 1,000 observations. Here are all my pies. I put the results into an object called save, for lack of a better name. Then I put save back in my contingency table, and this is what I get. Those are my counts. Do those counts make sense? Well, let's find the maximum likelihood estimates. So for example, pi hat 1, 1 is 0.191. What was the actual pi 1, 1? 0.2. Again, they're close to one another because they have essentially a large sample size. So you can conceptualize the counts in a contingency table as coming about through one multinomial. Now remember what we did in chapter or section 1.2. We basically said in a two by two table, we had one, one binomial in the first row, and then we had a second binomial in the second row. Well, the direct extension to that is to have a multinomial in the first row, a separate multinomial in the second row, all the way down to the i-th row as well. And that's what we will discuss next time. Are there any questions? A key element of doing this is that all your inferences and stuff that you do uh, by either using one overall multinomial or i multinomial distributions is everything is going to be work, will work out to be the same. Okay? That is it for today.